Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you all for coming out this morning. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to be speaking quickly because there's so much I would like to say in these next uh, 20 minutes before I, I pass the stage on. I have to start with the fact that my beloved wife, Deb, who I met at age 18, we got married at 21 in Oxford. We both got back from Shanghai about 30 hours ago and she is really feeling the effects right now. So she's here in spirit, but not in person. I will try to represent her as best, best I can. What I'm going to do is talk about what we've been, the way we've been spending the last year and a half of our working life, because I think it's, from my point of view, I'm going to explain it because it's the most interesting thing I think I've ever done, even including living in China, which we thought we stayed there as long as we did because every single day we told ourselves it's more interesting than horrible, and that kept us there. This has been a much more interesting and much less horrible um, prospect, and it is directly connected to many of the developments you heard about yesterday from various New America fellows and, and friends about kinds of, of recovery and resilience uh, across the country. So that's what I'm going to tell you about. I'm gonna spend about a minute giving you the setup for our project, two or three minutes giving you a little brief slideshow. I hardly ever do this, but just to give you some orientation of what it's like to see these places in Mississippi and Maine and Arizona and all the rest. And then I'm gonna to get to the payoff of the points we've discovered that are related to what New America is doing and what we're discussing during this conference. So um, about two years ago, when we came back from China and I'd, been, I'd finished number, some political pieces and defense pieces and all the rest, we decided that we would like to try to apply to the United States the, the policy that Deb and I had done in so many countries around the world, in Japan and Malaysia and China and elsewhere, which is just trying to see the fabric of the small parts of, of the country, to, not the big cities. And so in China, we'd done that on buses and trains. We thought this fit in the American tradition of the road trip narrative from Lewis and Clark onward. We also, we started this at a time when the central American narrative was that of decline. The financial crisis was not that far behind us. There were very few signs of manufacturing, other things coming back. So we wanted to see what it would look like to go to places off the grid, considering them not as curiosities, just because there'd been some grain elevator explosion or something like that, but reporting on them as, as real, real places and see what we would find. We had two criteria for the places we wanted to go. And these are the places where we've flown to and spent at least a week over the, the last while. One, we wanted them to be small-ish. And let me explain that. Um, we've been to places as big as Columbus, Ohio, which is a very large city. But the standard is a place that most people who are stylish or, van or graduating from fancy universities would think of as the sticks. They would think of, well, you're going to New York, you're going to Seattle, but I'm going to Ajo, Arizona, or Greenville, South Carolina, or Sioux Falls, or the rest. Also, we wanted to have places that had suffered a challenge of some kind economic, demographic, natural, or whatever, and it found to see how they recovered. I put a note on the Atlantic's website, we got more than a thousand essays back. People saying, you need to know this about this town in Louisiana, this town in Texas, this town in South Dakota. Uh, God willing, we could spend the next hundred years doing this, but uh, we're trying to see as much as, as we can. Let me just give you a sort of an idea of the kinds of places we've seen. I'm gonna give you a few seconds apiece per these various slaps. Uh, snapshots. This is the plane itself. There is Deb, not absent today, getting in the plane, taking our provisions. That's what it looks like inside the plane. We're crossing the Missouri River in uh, one of the Dakotas, I think from East River to West, West River. Uh, this is how you can see how the landscape was li laid out. We love flying at low altitude this way across the landscape. It's a unique view of what is interesting and beautiful and sometimes less sightly about America. You notice, number one, how many prisons there are, and number two, how many rock quarries. Um, this is the famous parachute for the plane. This is not our plane, but this was the test of concept. We're flying very safely, only daytime, no bad weather, but there is also the parachute, should the need arise. Uh, we went to Holland, Michigan, a little manufacturing town on Lake Michigan, which is beautiful and which has maintained manufacturing uh, supremacy in lots of ways. You have this kind of scene, it's a recycling plant, and you can read all about it. Uh, this is City Fathers in Holland, where they get 100 inches of snow per year. They volunteered their own money to build a sidewalk heating plan, so there's never snow on the streets or sidewalk of, of Holland. It's the way the city has kept going. This is Sioux Falls, South Dakota, with the eponymous falls downtown, and which has made itself a big tech place. Uh, this is part of the downtown movement, which I'll say more about. Uh, this is, Deb is not here today, but she's there with a giant Sioux Falls tractor. 
The reason I mention this is that Sioux Falls is an international leader in GPS-directed agriculture. That tractor is driven by GPS. It plants a seed in a precise location, puts a drop of fertilizer on that location, comes back a week later to water that location. It's a huge industry around the world. We've been to the Black Hills of South Dakota and to Rapid City. Rapid City has statues of all the presidents, life-size ones. That is Bill Clinton downtown. Uh, we've been, this is some, some of the oil territory of Wyoming. We saw the man camps there, so we're coming in for landing. Burlington, Vermont, famously nice place, Lake Champlain, et cetera. Uh, side note, if you want to see if there's a city on the rise, look for a craft brewery. No joke, this is a proxy for a city that has entrepreneurs, a young sort of creative class clientele. Deb has an embarrassing collection of photos of me like that. It's right after the airport. That's someplace in Michigan, I think. Uh, happier than I generally look. Uh, who knows about Hetty Topper beer? Anybody who knows beer, this is beer porn. This is by all accounts the best beer in the world. You can get it only in this part of Vermont, only get four cans at a time. That's what it looks like. That's like looking at Fort Knox for people in the business. Uh, this went to Eastport, Maine, a city of 1,300 people, which has a good news, bad news plan for the future. Good news, when the Canadian Arctic melts, they'll be the closest Atlantic seaport to China. Um, that's, that's, their, that's their glass half empty. Glass half full, they're on the Bay of Fundy. They're using tidal energy from the bay to become a tidal energy. That's downtown Eastport. Uh, Redlands, California, my hometown. I once worked in this orange packing plant. We went there to see how they're coping with drought and all the rest. That's with our marketplace partners out with orange groves, trying to see what they're doing about the blight that's destroying the citrus industry. South Carolina, a public residential high school that teaches ballet and the arts. In South Carolina, school innovation has been important. South Carolina, elementary school of engineering, something you don't see every day in the poorest part of town. This is St. Mary's, Georgia, trying to rebuild itself. Uh, this is a high school in St. Mary's, which I won't even give you a description about, but in addition to being the state, a perennial state champion in football, they train people coming out to go either to college or to have high-end skilled technical jobs in construction, in auto repair, in computer, in robotics, and all the rest. A very impressive school. Uh, this is Fresno, California. We've been recently. Fresno is a hard-pressed place that is trying hard to come back. Welcome to Fresno. Uh, this is, Fresno has a theory that it can become the next American Bohemia because the real estate is so cheap and that you can start your, uh, your drama troupe, you can become a fire blower or whatever else. Uh, those are walnuts bound for China. We've been in Winters, California about how the nut industry is dealing with drought. Uh, this is someplace, where is this? This is Mississippi. I say someplace because so many nice downtowns like this are coming up around the world. This is the Mississippi School for Math of Science, Math and Science, so touching, a public residential high school for poor people from Mississippi that's sending kids to Harvard, it's sending them to Claremont McKenna. This was a dramatization of this city's Civil War past, which just was tremendously evocative and, and wonderful, wonderful kids there. Uh, this is Duluth, Minnesota, the rise of minor league ball in Duluth. Uh, this is Duluth with a monument to the most northerly lynching in American history. Uh, which happened in, in Duluth, and they've, they've made a big effort to remember it. Allentown, Pennsylvania, the mayor there, the mayor who has rebuilt single-handedly the downtown of Allentown in a tech space where young people are going to live over the top of the tech company they're building. Charleston, West Virginia, downtown revitalization. This is in the Cristo Ray schools in Columbus, Ohio, which have had a sort of uh, public-private partnership to deal with people who are going to fall behind the cracks. Uh, this is a, a town in Pit a house in Pittsburgh covered with Chinese characters. You can go to our site and read about it to explain why that is the case. Ajo, Arizona, a city of about a thousand people, right on the southern border, border, which is using the arts as a tool for uh, bringing itself back. It's also using the successor to the WPA. These are kids from the N Triple C, the, the uh, new sort of AmeriCorps staff, who were there trying to rebuild the town. Again, it's as touching a thing as you might see. Riverside, California, trying to rebuild its downtown. The first McDonald's anywhere in history in the most troubled town we've seen, San Bernardino, California. And that's uh, close also to where I, I grew up. As we've, this is just to give you an idea of the kinds of things we have seen as we've been on the road. Let me now, uh, sort of um, rapid fire fashion, go through lessons we have learned that I think are directly relevant to what a new America is doing and so many of the cooperative uh, efforts we have. Lesson number one, 
the generally positive impression you would have of America if you ignored national politics. The you know, national politics we know as being severely troubled, and, and everybody here has, has, has insights on that, and we know about all of the various imbalances and inequities and all the rest. If you didn't know about any of that, and you were exploring this country for the first time in the way that we have done other countries, you would think this is a place where things are going on, where people care about their communities, where they have uh, some confidence in the future, where they're able to work with people of different uh, backgrounds and all the rest. So number one, we started this when the American narrative was much more negative than it is now. We are as aware of the problems of this country as any of you are, but just the fabric city by city, region by region, you would think there's a place where people believe things are going well. What one, one illustration from Fresno. Fresno, who's been there? Fresno is not seen as one of California's chic towns. I was interviewing a tech entrepreneur there who moved there from the East Coast saying, he'd grown up there saying, we're just sick and tired of being told this is a place for losers. You know, our parents can say that, I'm 28 years old, I wanna make something happen here, and he's, he's making it happen. So number one, the generally positive tone in a non-just cutesy way you get by traveling, traveling around. Uh, impression number two, the functionality of politics, again, when you move below the paralyzed national level. We find in our national level politics an inability to compromise, a zero sum outlook, a difficulty to look in the long run, all the other things you're familiar with. We have found the opposite of that most of the places, not all, but most of the places we have gone. Here's the clearest illustration I can give you. Greenville, South Carolina is a very right-wing town. Jim DeMint was their congressman, Bob Jones University is there, Romney carried it by 30 points. It was the last county in the last state to observe Martin Luther King's uh, birthday as a holiday. Uh, Burlington, Vermont is the other extreme. The two parties there in local politics are the Democrats and the Socialists. Bernie Sanders was a Socialist mayor there, Obama carried it by 30 points over Romney. If you didn't know that, you, were, you would think they were the same town. The mayor works with the universities, with the businesses, with the schools, with community groups, and they have a very similar look and feel. They both have beautiful downtowns, they both have universities. That is a shorthand for a kind of thing we've seen lots of places. Again, not every place. San Bernardino, which I'm about to write about next week, is in trouble because it almost uniquely still has national style broken politics for reasons I'll explain. Third lesson that we found, a surprising talent dispersal property. If you talk to young people getting out of fancy schools, you will assume that if they want to make it, they need to go essentially to six metro areas, Boston, New York, DC, Seattle, San Francisco, LA, with some polite acknowledgement of San Diego and Chicago and Atlanta and all the rest. And we know all these con concentrating trends. What's interesting is also an offsetting trend of people deciding that they can make a first rate life for themselves doing agricultural technology in Sioux Falls or in Fresno, doing design work in Greenville, South Carolina, which out of Bob Jones has a great design department, uh, can do things in, in, in lots of, in Burlington and many other places in, in Duluth. A subcategory here is the crucially important factor of real estate prices. In the six big cities I mentioned, everything is distorted by the crushing burden of real estate. In the rest of America, real estate is cheap. You can buy a house for a couple hundred thousand dollars, not a couple million dollars. You can start a dance troupe or a company or all the rest. And that opportunity for America we found dispersed through the magic of, of both people recognizing that and having the advantage of real estate. Fourth thing we have observed, the power of immigration goes on. Immigration in the DC perspective is something that is a polarizing issue. It's a problem in the, in the Republican party especially, et cetera, et cetera. Most of the places we have gone, if you were a foreigner looking at them, you would, be, you would remark on how thoroughly this process is still happening. Partly involves refugees. Sioux Falls, in Sioux Falls, they have one of the world's biggest pig slaughterhouses that's now owned by the Chinese. It's a long story. Most of the people working there are female refugees from Somalia, the Sudan, um, Cameroon, some other places, who are making money, slaughtering pigs, wearing their often a Muslim headgear so they can send their kids to school. The leader of ROTC in the Sioux Falls High School is a, uh, the daughter of a Somali uh, refugee of that sort. Immigration historically is always disruptive. 
we have been impressed by the ways in which it is being absorbed. The Midwest is largely Latino now. Uh, you know, Dodge City, Kansas is a majority Latino uh, uh, city. But if you compare this with any other part of the world, I think you're impressed that this is, is continuing uh, to, to happen. Number five, observation. The rise of downtowns is real. There is enough leftover good looking real, uh, building from the, the 1800s and the early uh, 1900s that hasn't been torn down in enough places that cities in every corner of the country are finding this a way they can revive the downtowns, they can attract younger people to live there. There's a whole metric for this involving river walks and downtown uh, residential and all the rest. Deb wrote an article about how you have a river walk without a river, which a number of cities have done. But we've, uh, we've, we've been very, very impressed by, in every scale of city, you see this downtown uh, revival in, in different stages. Um, number six, the manufacturing uh, renaissance, I'm not say full sale recovery, but, but a, a dispersed renaissance in manufacturing also is real. We've seen uh, companies in Duluth that have sort of spun off from the aviation center there with Cirrus that are now exporting their products around the world. Also in Mississippi, where there's a giant helicopter factory near this Mississippi School of Math and Sciences. I just will not give you any more details, but again, the trend is factories on the sm small scale beginning to open again rather than just close in the way they were before. A seventh observation we have seen, and maybe signaled in shorthand by some of the school photos I gave, is experimentation in public schools. When we began this process, we assumed, as you would from national media, that most of the country was regarding itself as the object of big historic forces, whereas in fact, most people regard themselves as active shapers of their, their lives, that public schools were a disaster, et cetera, et cetera. Every place we have been, we found people experimenting with the public schools and finding ways to adapt them to the local needs and take advantage of the local strengths. Deb has written about this extensively. It's what she would have been talking about if she were here. But in Central Valley, California, you have schools training migrant workers' children for jobs in sort of high-tech agriculture. In coastal Maine, you have them training for maritime uh, careers, including that Northwest Passage. You find this sort of uh, adaptability all, all around the country. And that's something we've, we've been, been impressed by. Um, number eight observation has been the, to me, entirely unexpected, crucial emphasis of community colleges. We all know that research universities are part of America's arsenal that no one else uh, can match. I hadn't appreciated how much community colleges are the connective fiber for people who are not going to Berkeley or Stanford or Yale or Arizona State or other big research universities, but want some job other than working in Walmart or working in a food service industry. Community colleges are the connectors. Uh, I've written a lot about one called East Mississippi Community College in the so-called Golden Triangle of Mississippi. Who knows what cities are in the Golden Triangle? You have to read our site to find out. I won't tell you here. Uh, but one of them is the home of Mississippi State University. But this East Mississippi Community College for a large uh, tire factory, Yokohama Tire, and a large diesel engine factory there is training people who were on welfare, were on food stamps, were in prison, tra training these people for high wage manufacturing jobs and for robotic repair type jobs. Community colleges are what make this, this happen. The ninth thing we have seen is what I would describe as the thickness of the social fabric. Everyone here has either read or heard of the Bowling Alone Hypothesis by, uh, by Robert Putnam. We recognize all the things that fragment America, sprawl suburbs and sprawl um, metropol uh, metropolises are bad and cr contribute to that, but it's been surprisingly easy to find signs of dense social fabric. Um, Deb has also written a lot about the, the role that libraries play here. Libraries are, in a way, the sort of fastest rebounding institutions we've seen. They are workspaces. Uh, they are training people in languages and all, all the rest. Um, Deb has pointed out that when Andrew Carnegie founded his libraries, he thought they would be social centers. His original libraries had bowling alleys, they had swimming pools, they had bars. It's sort of coming back to that tradition with some of the libraries we have seen as part of this sense of, it's a proxy for the thickness of fabric we've seen in a lot of places. And number 10, the last observation is, the narrative we have heard in a lot of these places is not meant as a challenge to the national narrative of paralysis, gridlock, hopelessness, nothing you can do, but just ignores it. 
you know, that is unfortunate because it would be good to have a national politics that functioned. But in the absence of that for this stage of history, it's impressive how the tale many of these cities are telling themselves is we can make this downtown better. We can bring this factory back. We can attract our children to come here. We can have places that look better 10 years from now than, than they, they do now. To conclude in my final 15 seconds by, by, by the clock, we went around China and Japan and Southeast Asia looking for the impression you would get from the fabric of the country. That's what we've been doing for the past year. We plan to do it for another year or so, then do a book and video series. The actual feeling of this country is more positive than you would think from the, the discourse we mainly have in our national politics. This, I think, is worth being aware of and helping to give a name to the reforms and improvements that are going on so people who are doing them in one state can know they're doing it in another state and we can have a different sort of national narrative of what the responses that uh, the country is making. So that's why I was so happy to hear the, the, uh, the projects underway yesterday and I turn the stage over now to hear even more.